Madeleine de Valera. Good evening everybody and a very big welcome to de Valera Library. My name is Cora Gunter, I'm the librarian here and it's with great pleasure that we're hosting the launch of a very special ladies, very special book. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Mr. Dominic Taylor from the Limerick Writer Centre who is going to say a few words. So can we give him a big warm de Valera welcome. Thank you. Thanks for it. Appreciate it. And thanks to all of you uh, for coming here tonight to celebrate the publication of Liz's debut uh, collection of short stories. As publishers of the book, uh, I just want to set out the role of the Limerick Writer Centre. And basically what we try to do is bring ideas about books, literature and writing to as wide an audience as possible. Our core value has always been that literature is essential. And we believe in the love of reading, in the art of writing, and in the power of the literary arts to transform individual lives and communities. We work to advance the artistic development of writers, and we try to foster a thriving literary community. And I think that the shortlisting in 2016 of one of our writers, Ron Carey, a poet from the largely working class estate of Balnanty in Limerick, for one of the most prestigious literary awards in Ireland and the UK, the Forward Prize, is some evidence of our success in trying to foster an inclusive reading and writing community. The poet Robert Frost said that the delight in writing is the surprise of remembering something I didn't know I knew that results in a clarification of life and a momentary stay against confusion. That, I think, encapsulates in a small way what we try to achieve for our writers. The book we are launching tonight is the 70th title the Limerick Writers' Centre has published since 2008 under its community publishing initiative. At the Limerick Writers' Centre, we share a belief that writing and publishing should be both made available and accessible to all. And we try as much as possible to represent diverse voices and advocate for increased writing and publishing access to individuals and groups that have not typically had this access. We encourage everyone to actively engage within the literary community. Through public performances, we bring together groups of people who value literature not just for its literary value, but who see its transformative power both for the individual and society. And we believe that stories, poems, diaries, memoirs do, as Seamus Heaney suggests, function as bearers of value. We are also importantly dedicated to printing short-run, high-quality produced titles that are accessible to readers. We actively encourage writers to be serious career-minded to people who write for pleasure, healing, personal growth, insight, or just to inform. And over the years, we have produced a broad range of writing, including poetry, history, memoir, and general prose. So, once again, I'm delighted to see so many of you here tonight to support Liz and the launch of her book, and I wish her great success with it. Thank you very much. I'm now going to call on Sianna Campbell, who's going to say a few words. really on this month of new beginnings and we're launching this new entity out into the world, Liz Price's collection, The Fish Woman and Other Stories. There's even lovely alliteration in the idea of Liz's launch, so <laughs> keep that in mind. Now, some months ago Liz very kindly extended an invitation to me to launch the collection and I was absolutely thrilled to accept. We share membership of the same book club and I see many of the members of the book club are here tonight which is lovely. We were aware that her writing was bearing fruit and we were excited at the prospect of publication. There was a very entertaining session uh, a number of years ago during the Ennis Book Club Festival when author Anna Hussov gave 21 <coughs> tips for book clubs based on her 21 years as a book club member and one of her tips 
she suggested that book clubs should have a published author in their midst. <laughs> <laughs> One of the members should go for it. And here we are with that very physical thing. A real book in a temple of reading and a published author. So when Liz asked me to perform the launch, I asked her to send on the manuscript. But that didn't happen straight away. She almost seemed reluctant <laughs> to let it go forth. <laughs> now, proofing was mentioned and so on, but I suspect that it had more to do with that ambivalence <coughs> that we can feel about letting our, our loved ones, our creations, out into the world to manage for themselves. Because, of course, that is what writers must do. They must allow us, the readers, to finish the process to bring our imaginations to bear, our interpretations, our sensibilities. And that requires commitment and courage. So the manuscript took a little while to arrive. But it came with a glorious coincidence that I would like to share. And maybe I'll ask, was it just a coincidence? So on a crisp, cold day after Christmas, and after all those storms, my family and I were out for a walk on the flaggy shore. Many of you will know it, it's beautiful. And my husband spotted a small fish on the roadside. Now, this fish was some distance from the water and we wondered how it had arrived there. It looked too fresh to have just been thrown up maybe in the storms a couple of days before. And we eventually figured that it was probably some bird's takeaway meal and it had wriggled free and fallen to the ground. We didn't immediately know what type of fish it was, so of course we had to take photographs. And of course our daughters then had to do you know, social media things with lots of photographs and so on. But just as we were doing all of that, I thought I spotted the tiniest little movement. Could it still be alive? So I found a plastic bag, carried it in it, and resolved to get it into the water as soon as possible. But that turned out to be about 40 minutes later, because the tide was so far out, the rocks with all the seaweed were so slippy, and there literally wasn't an access point until we got almost back to the car park. So, didn't hold out very much hope, but the others spurred me on, got to the water's edge, you can just imagine the light was failing, stars beginning to twinkle, and as they say in Clare, I just let them off. Nothing happened for a couple of minutes, and we were about to turn and head for home. There was a sudden movement, and then a little wriggle, and our common Blenny, we eventually identified it, but he surged forward, literally just went straight into the waves and took off to freedom. And of course the girls were Instagramming like mad and I said that I would be forever known as fishwife. <laughs> of course the coincidence is that when I checked my phone a little while later I saw that Liz had finally sent her manuscript. And up until then I hadn't known the title. But there was something magical about seeing the fish woman and other stories <laughs> after our wee adventure at the flaggy show. Was it a coincidence? So, just like the wee fish, how do we launch a book? How best to set those words, characters, narratives free to chart their own destinies, their own courses in the world, how to help them navigate the rapids, the changing tides, the still waters that might run deep. So maybe it's best if I share my reading experience with you. I read this book in one sitting, but it was no ordinary sitting. I was on a flight to Rome. I suppose you could say that I literally flew through it. <laughs> As we were transported across countries and seas and mountain ranges, I found myself transported through time and place by the power of Liz's writing. Many of us know Liz as a doer, an organiser, 
She chairs committees. She shapes policy. Raises funds. She manages people. She dances. She plays music. She lives life to the full. She's never idle. But in her writing, we see another side. We see her keen powers of observation her careful recall of conversational styles, her ability to drill down into memory in order to create. And these stories reveal tremendous insight into the lives of real people, <coughs> those marginalized in society by virtue of the circumstances of their birth, those losing their place in the world as dementia takes hold, those bravely trying to hold communities and families together. The voices that we meet, they're authentic. And we experience the emotional turmoil behind unremarkable lives. We read two of the transformative effects of music in Noreen's song, of the powerful sense of place and time and disconnection in condolences. I can guarantee you'll enjoy Rick's comeuppance in the highest mountain. <laughs> you might identify with the food-obsessed book club members with an appetite <laughs> for books. Liz introduces us to Jed as he worries about lost and found tempers. We follow the twisted choreography of grandparent envy. And of course, we meet the fishwoman and her fervent hopes for her little princess, will they be realized? As you read, you'll be struck by how familiar many of the stories or characters appear. Liz has deftly drawn them so that we do have a sense of peering into familiar lives and maybe even reliving moments from our own stories. And that's the power of the storyteller. That's the ability to draw us in, to create that viewing spot that doesn't feel voyeuristic. We feel as if we bear witness to life in all its messy glory. In the words of that beautiful limerick songstress Dolores O'Riordan, these stories will linger in your lives. Huge congratulations and thank you Liz for creating these works in such liquid prose. And thanks also to your writing circle, English Creative Writers Group, which I know acts as a sort of collective midwife in providing a space and support and encouragement and practical advice. Huge acknowledgement also obviously to Dominic and the Limerick uh, Writers Centre as well for all of what you do. It was wonderful to listen to your words a moment ago. And I'm sure that Andy and Emily and Claire and Joe and even baby Ava Rose have helped to spur you on as well. So just as that little fish on the flaggy shore flicked his tail and faced the world, not suggesting that you do any tail flicking, but whatever, <laughs> I commend this collection to you all. Tonight we're uniting in this lodge because for you, the readers, you must now fulfil your roles by taking the book home with you to set those words free. Because we're all honorary fishwives tonight. <laughs> it now gives me enormous pleasure to invite Liz to come and to read to you. For Liz Price. two short stories from the book, if that's okay. One is very short. Um, the first one I'm going to read is um, about dementia. And I'll just give you just a little insight into why I wrote this. Is, um, a lot of you will know I'm involved in the Alzheimer's Society and have been for a number of years. And last year we, we opened our new daycare centre. And I went up there the first day and when I was driving up I was thinking about the journey of uh, taking my own, own mother up, you know, to for respite and when she went in for care. And um, I was just thinking about the awfulness of that handing over somebody you love to the care, you know, somebody very vulnerable to the care of others. And when I went in, 
it was just so lovely. Everything was so nice and the staff were just so kind and so caring that I wrote this story um, and I dedicated it to our staff and our wonderful volunteers. And I see Bridget here and Nalik are here and Rhonda and Maureen. Um, so this is for all of you and all the great work you've done for years. So it's called Don't Turn Left. Back then, we planned for everything. We even planned for this day, although in a clinical kind of way. But that's your strength, careful planning, paying attention to detail, <coughs> or I should say, it was your strength. In that other life, when you still had strengths. Once we'd got over the first few weeks, when it was too painful to speak without tears and the anger would send me crashing through the house, banging doors, we found a way to talk. We discussed the future, you earnestly, me, in a surreal way. Something had shifted, something had crept in between us since we'd had the diagnosis confirmed, since a second opinion stated that you are not, in fact, too young to have dementia. And that was when I realised some words are so terrible you feel them with your whole body. As always with difficulties, you saw this as a project that you attacked with great faith and self-assurance. Visits were planned to accountants and support groups. You were still the strong one in those days, still able to instil in me the unlikely possibility that everything would work out fine. I could see in you the intense young man you had once been, who had battled adversity, whose youth had been worked out of him before he had time to enjoy it. And I felt the injustice deeply, that now your middle age was also to be stolen. But this time, it was to be stolen from both of us. I faithfully attended the support groups, coming together with others travelling the same road, trying to mend our brokenness. Maybe in this space I could safely examine my wounds. I listened to all the reassuring words and let them flow over me and through me and watched as they streamed away, leaving me emptier than before. Gradually, we developed our new language of good days and bad days. <coughs> We'd finish each other's sentences. I'm oh, sorry, on good days, a flicker of light would appear through the cracks. We would finish each other's sentences like we always had done. If I forgot something, we'd laugh and question which of us the diagnosis was meant for. Those days, I tried to believe that my shriveled heart could mend. But the bad days wouldn't stop coming. I would awkwardly explain to you again and again that I was your wife. I'd wrestle with you at the front door to prevent you leaving for the home that hadn't existed for 20 years and the worst of all days, when you would creep furtively into the bathroom bewildered by your wet underclothes. On those days, I felt all hope seep away, oozing like blood from an, un from an unhealed wound. Our plan for this day, when I would take you to the nursing home, hadn't included me driving along the cliff road, imagining how it might feel to hurtle downwards part of me wishing for it, even as I held my breath in dread of it. It hadn't prepared me for the anger I would feel, watching the man I loved unravel before my eyes. You'd stayed at the nursing home a couple of times previously for short breaks, respite breaks, which I was assured were as much to give me a rest as you. But no matter how I tried, I couldn't find a truthful way to disown the guilt that flowed over me threatening to drown me. Inky clouds hanging low in the sky accompanied us on our journey. They created an illusion of shelter and exposure. Before this other life, you would have admired the rawness of the scenery, the nude trees standing stoically against the wind, skimpy skirts of ivy and moss their only cover. I always imagined these scenes appealed to you because of the harshness of your life. You would have stopped the car to watch the white water tumbling angrily down the rock face and laughed 
as I drew my coat closer around me in answer to your suggestion that I get out for a breath of air. I felt so safe around you and your energy and your courage. You glanced at me as we approached the entrance to the home and I read too much into the look and imagined you were pleading with me not to turn left. So I asked if you knew where we were and then repeated the question when you didn't reply, although I knew you became upset if you were asked questions, as if people wanted more from you than you could give. And of course I did want much more. The next step was too big to contemplate and the blustery rain gave an excuse to delay a while. We sat <coughs> together in the car park, and I chatted, but you dozed off, and I watched you sleep, your vulnerability bruising me. When the rain eased, you struggled awkwardly to get out of the car, hands flaying and grasping for support. You were to be encouraged to do as much as possible for yourself, so I clenched my jaw tightly against the awful indignity. It was one of those days when there's just enough light to make it seem like <coughs> evening all day long. But a comforting glow spilled out from the windows of the centre and drew us in. The nurse smelt of freshly laundered clothes and sunshine <coughs> and you smiled and winked at her. I guessed what you'd been like before we met and felt the past and the future press hard on either side of me. I was pleased when the nurse spoke to you directly and not through me as most people did now since you had become this non-person. When she spoke to me, her voice was soft. But when you're suffering, every touch causes pain, no matter how kindly meant. I listened anxiously for the reproach in her voice and although it wasn't there, I felt it just the same. Your small bedroom was welcoming and I felt a mixture of relief when I noticed the unambiguous signs in large print and anger that they were needed. I noticed the thickening mist and the wispy puffs of fog hovering around the window and wondered if that was how you perceived the world. I wondered also if the distance between us was too great. We joined a small group huddled around the fire in the day room a nurse came in and placed a beautiful plant on the table and asked if anyone would like to sing a song. She smiled gently with the others. And watching her, I could hardly believe that the saddest thing that could happen in the world really did happen sometimes. You reached for my hand and we joined in the singing. I felt the guilt subside, knowing it would resurface later. We sat close to the fire and I only discovered my need for warmth when it was satisfied. A sweet weariness came over me. For a minute, there was just the sound of the clock ticking in the corner. tonight was really kind and Sienna for your kind words and I can't believe you read the whole book. It's <laughs> impressive. Um, but this book really, um, I was very lucky to get the opportunity to be published because I'd never, it wasn't anything I ever really wanted. But when I heard in January of this year that my daughter was expecting our first grandchild who's here tonight, I thought I'd love her to think she had a brave granny. Yeah. So this book was dedicated oh. to the Rose, yeah. the little angel. And another miserable story, but it's short. <laughs> <laughs> it's called The River. I stood for a moment in the jaundiced glow of the street lamp and watched the gentle drift of the river. An unremarkable elderly man in a neatly pressed suit, the, drizzling, the drizzle creating cobwebs on his grey hair and moustache. Behind him, Unobtrusive traffic weaved its way through the quiet calm of the late evening streets. An ordinary weeknight in early October. 
yet destined to become the most significant of markers on the yardstick of all who knew him. That was the week before it happened. Or it was this night last year we heard the news. Even the prostitutes on the dock road who claimed some proficiency in noticing unaccompanied gentlemen were oblivious when the old man walked past. Or at least none of them recalled having seen him when the police questioned them later. Deep, blood-coloured lipstick and silvery, sparkling eyeshadow painted hard looks on their face for their night's work. But their eyes rounded with softness when they heard the news, maybe recognising in him a fellow traveller on the shadowy margins. Nobody remembered seeing him place the pitiful bundle on the ground, the watch he'd been given on his retirement, or the neatly handwritten letter. Was the handkerchief he'd used to wrap them carefully chosen for its significance, or maybe picked at random for its insignificance? <coughs> Nobody left to ask. Neighbours huddled guiltily when they heard the news, regretting the invitations never issued. Invitations he may have felt obliged to accept, which over time could have become a type of slavery for both, people, both parties. Nobody would ever know now. They talked about the majestic Shannon hosted proudly by their city, using their newly discovered language, tides and currents, and where and when bodies were likely to wash up. With a mixture of dread and fascination, they wondered what it must feel like to be lured into her depths and held, while she greedily sucked the life from you. They shivered and agreed it didn't bear thinking about, but they thought of nothing else. Snatches of the story were carried in whispers by people who knew the old man and strangers alike. But the unforgiving picture created of that October night could not be reconciled with the image they held of their city. A gentler account would soon be woven into their beloved river's history. Nobody would speak about the bloated body dragged from the river, the face washed clean of everything except indignity. about a song that Noreen wrote and I was present when it was sung. Now it's a guy in the story because I always changed it a little but it is about I was inspired when I was in Brogan's one night and Noreen sang it. Um, can I just say thanks to everybody for coming out tonight and thank you so much for the people who've travelled from Dublin, my dear friend Nicola and my family and for all the support. Um, you know when you do this you're a pain in the ass when you're writing something like this because you, you read and reread and reread you know and it gets so boring and my son used to say ma'am I really try to listen but I zone out when I hear boring things. I don't know if you to any of them but um, thank you all very much. And, uh, well done. Well done. Well done.